Hi everyone, good afternoon. I'm sitting here in Barcelona from my studio of Funnel TV. I'm actually locked down at home. And uh, this is the third episode of uh, the Digital Transformation Happy Hour. How are you, Scott? I'm doing great, Enzo. How are you doing today? I, I, I bet you're sitting at home. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah, I got all dressed up for you, though. See, put a nice tie on. Everything looks good today. Yeah, I mean, I, we feel we're uh, going to work anyway. You know, that's that's yeah. the that's the feeling. We have to keep exactly up, right. You can't you can't see my pajama bottoms, but that's all right. It's <laughs> well, the camera so. is covering the right. You know, <laughs> thank goodness. That's exactly right. Right. So cool. I know you have a great um, guest and I'm actually really glad for that because I've been working uh, with this person you're going to do this um, right now and um, is representing a, a big player in the market, Regain. So should we open this camera? You bet. Yeah, let's bring uh, let's bring Chinmay on. I, I'm super excited, as you mentioned, uh, joining me today on the Digital Transformation Happy Hour is uh, Chinmay Sharma, uh, and we'll get an opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, about how we know each other and some of the cool things that he's done in the business. Uh, so, welcome, Chinmay. Glad you could be with us today. Thank you, Scott. Hey, Enzo. Morning and afternoon, everyone. Very good to be here. Good to see you, man. So, man, let's jump right into it. You know, uh, this show is all about connecting. Um, students and young hoteliers uh, with the opportunities that are in the digital transformation space. And uh, clearly you're running, uh, you know, one of the 10,000 pound gorillas at this point in the space. Um, and so uh, I, I'm excited to talk. So let's let's get in. Um, in addition to being successful, you're running a big company now, which we'll talk about. Uh, we'll talk about in a little bit. Your career has been pretty interesting. So, um, I mean, just share some highlights with us for those for those that don't know you that well. Great. Thanks, Scott. Yes. Uh, so I've been lucky to be in the travel business now for over two decades. Um, early in the business, I did an undergrad in hotel management. And then my first interest was, uh, even though I got trained in food and beverage, housekeeping, production, front office, uh, my interest was always customer facing. And the, the reservations part and the inventory management was always of, uh, of interest. So, so even though I did a couple of uh, gigs into fast food etc which was really fun uh, my first real job was with a hotel company called Taj Hotels out of India uh, this was back in 1997 I think um, and we were we initially started in front office and then we were handpicked as uh, a group of seven revenue management executives that were supposed to be based in their uh, luxury properties to uh, uh, introduce the revenue management program for the first time so a lot of learnings there and I pretty much fell in love with revenue management uh, straight away. Uh, so most of my background fast forward since then has been in revenue management and distribution. Um, I've been fortunate to work in, you know, medium and large enterprises across different geographies. Um, and the work experience has included uh, small boutique hotel chains, huge uh, franchise companies like Wyndham, some technology companies like Expedia, uh, stint with private equity companies like Star Wars Capital, um, and then uh, now I'm with a travel technology uh, company, which is a completely different ballgame, but uh, really enjoying it so far. <laughs> it's cool. Um, so, I mean, you mentioned you put revenue management in place for the first time. I actually was one of those people right place at the right time, to be honest with you. Uh, Robert Cross said right product, uh, right person. But for me, it was right place, right time. Right. Um, and uh, but it's changed so much. Right. I mean, I remember I was a regional and, and the part of the major selection process was who at the front desk was best at Excel. <laughs> you know, it was a pretty unsophisticated approach. Um, I mean, how, how's it you've seen it evolve since that? Like, how has that been? I mean, it's been, been interesting. But how's it been for you personally? Yeah, I think the experience at uh, starting revenue management at a hotel company that was a year old, uh, even like two decades ago, was was really uh, uh, very interesting and a, and a good opportunity. I think revenue management has evolved quite a bit. I mean, back in the day, as long as you spoke English and you could open Excel, uh, you were in. <laughs> uh, I think it's become a lot more complicated. The distribution channels have become more complicated. Uh, technology is helping a lot, uh, but at the same time, I think uh, the companies that do revenue management and distribution well also rely on really, uh, uh, you know, really significant and uh, trained manpower. And I think that's where institutes like Leroche, et cetera, uh, play a very significant game as well, because companies like us, as well as uh, companies in the hospitality business, they're always looking out for talent 
uh, that has some training and exposure and is willing to uh, to scale up. So, uh, so at least in the revenue management arena, I've just seen that things have become more complicated. Uh, the distribution world is changing very fast. Uh, the world has shrunk. So, I think combining revenue management with distribution, optimal mix, uh, sales, marketing, and how each of these disciplines play versus each other uh, and support, I think that's become critical. So those silos luckily are coming down, which is really interesting to see. I think um, you make a really interesting uh, comment. You know, when uh, when I got into revenue management, it was the center. Um, we were determining one price. You know, there weren't all these distribution channels. There wasn't all this complexity. Um, and and now it's really become kind of a convergence as opposed to the center, right? You 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 go from, uh, you know, I was was. Um, I thought making a lot of the decisions, I was building really cool Excel tools. We all were, if you remember, and really amazing, you know, every single week's meeting was a new thing I had for a while. Um, and now it's become something really that it's, it's about understanding existing technology, letting technology people focus on technology. But that person is, it's kind of like this, the, the hub on the, on the whole thing, right? They, they have to know so many more, uh, there's so many more diverse skills. I mean, I, and I've been fortunate enough to learn them over the course of 20 years. But if you drop them, drop someone into the chair, I'm a little bit mind boggled about how you would, I mean, you know, think about it. It was revenue management then, but now it's revenue management, but it's also distribution <laughs> and it's right. also revenue generation. You know, it's, it's, it's big things that I think when I started would have been a separate job and now they all sit in one chair. So yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's evolved a tremendous, a tremendous amount. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's really cool the opportunity that you had to put that in place. It really helps you understand the foundation. It also helps you understand, I think, the, the other piece that you said, which is um, sometimes the, the, the total technocrat is not the right person for this job anymore. A lot of it now is about communication and about, um, um, you know, it's not just about knowing what the right answer is, but quite frankly, it's about getting, getting buy off on the right answer, which is, um, you know, sometimes more difficult, right? And, and I think sometimes two thirds of it is is being able to communicate properly, not necessarily being able to analyze. Right. Um, and so, and I would say, you know, in knowing you a little bit, I think that's um, one of the things that was probably led to you being very successful is that as you were learning all this stuff, you also learned that it was better to communicate about it in ways that the people that weren't spending the time to learn it understood. And um, and it because there was a time, if you remember, when one of the styles of revenue managing was to baffle everyone with big terms and, 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 you know, confusing things and to talk about algorithms before algorithms were really very much in play and stuff like that. Uh, And so now it's it's evolved, right? So um, what do do you think the profile of today's revenue manager would be if you were going to, you know, describe the person? Yeah, I think, I think um, uh, the basics of uh, having an analytical mind, um, and being being sharp, uh, I think those are those are given. But I think what's really important to your point also is the ability to communicate, ability to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Historically, if you remember our days in revenue management, revenue management and sales always used to be at loggerheads. Uh, <laughs> and, right. and I think now everybody's kind of understood what the swim lanes are. And I think we as leaders have done a good job of ensuring that uh, the key result areas are common across the board so that the general manager the sales head and the revenue head at the unit level are all in sync. And even at the corporate world, uh, I've seen more and more synergies. Um, so as the, as the discipline has evolved, uh, so has the qualifying criteria. Uh, so, uh, and the opportunities for the revenue management personnel have grown as well, because you're almost like an asset manager. You're almost like an auditor of revenue, traffic control, uh, you know, what goes through, what doesn't go through. Uh, I've seen revenue managers become CEO, uh, asset managers of large uh, uh, companies. Uh, And then I think the big revolution probably came about 10 years ago where it was not only about yield management and controlling what's coming in, but how do you impact demand generation? Um, So I think the revenue manager of today also needs to understand uh, how do you create demand? Because in the hotel world, there are two big channels, qualified and non-qualified. Uh, and the qualified uh, channels are, you know, run morely, more by sales team, but in close coordination with revenue management because the revenue management guys will, you know, come up with controls and mechanisms on, you know, rate thresholds, rate volume relationships, uh, contracted rates, et cetera. But the larger part typically is non-qualified, which is related to best available and retail rates. And that has a direct impact on, on uh, volume. Uh, so now that the industry understands the value of uh, revenue management folks, and I think the ones who are successful are the ones who understand not only the revenue controls, but also 
uh, how you which levers to move on digital marketing, what metrics to look at, um, which channel is performing well or not, how much to spend on brand direct, uh, what is the cost of CPC, what is the net yield of a contracted rate. Uh, so the job has become uh, definitely a lot more complex. And the good thing is, you know, the tools have evolved as well. Um, so many companies, ours included, is is doing a lot of job, a lot of work in ensuring that folks in revenue management, distribution, and commercial have all the tools they require to look at the marketplace in real time. Um, so it's it's very competitive, but uh, it's a very exciting field. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that, and in, in, I want to <clears throat> I want to uh, hold on to that. Um, you know, certain that, that companies that help hotels run better because that's a new concept since we started to, I mean, I think, you know, when I started in, in pretty soon after I got involved in revenue management, there was travel click, right. And I don't, don't, you know, travel click is your company. Um, and, but the predominant reason we talked to them was for GDS advertising. So, right. uh, so think about how the world has changed. I mean, it's, 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 it's amazing. I want to jump back to your career for a second though, because there are some things in there that, uh, are super, uh, are, are fascinating. And this is a very international, uh, La Roche is a very international school, of course, but it's a very international show as well. Uh, and, and right now, um, you know, we're sitting, uh, all of us in, 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 in definitely different locations. Um, so there's a couple of things that I wanted to kind of talk about. And one of them is, you know, the opportunity to work in three continents, you know, so um, you mentioned your Taj experience a little bit. Tell us a little bit more about, well, I want to get into that in a second because you worked with a, an industry icon that I want to talk about. Um, but, uh, um, and then you had an opportunity to work here in Europe, of course, and now you're sitting in the U.S. and you've worked in the U.S. before, as, as, as I know, and, and people don't know. But I mean, how is that? This, I mean, this is a, 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 a certainly an international business, but there must be some nuances culturally as you move around. Tell us, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, no, definitely. I think I've been very lucky that I got the opportunity of working across uh, different geographies. Um, I think being part and uh, part of teams and managing teams across different geographies and cultures is very different uh, as well. It's been a great learning for me. Um, and, and I think uh, the good thing about this business is that it's a global business. And, and for anybody uh, who's interested in getting in, I mean, I'm always for it, but the biggest advantage you get is that your skills are transferable and the experiences that you get are you know, quite amazing. Unfortunately, you never make um, as much money as uh, maybe banking or some of the other businesses, but you have uh, definitely have a lot of fun and, and every day is, uh, is super interesting. So, um, I mean, I grew up in India. I started working in India before I went for my master's in, in Europe. Uh, uh, I did some of the internships with companies like Expedia and Brussels, etc. And then I was fortunate to start with Expedia during the early days in 2003. Um, and the distribution world was just uh, growing. So I think uh, I spent about 10, 12 years in the US, about five plus in Europe uh, and then a fair amount in, in Asia, uh, mostly in India as well. And I think what that just helps you with is uh, just being a little bit more global, understanding what trends uh, exist from a people management and team perspective. You just understand the nuances a little bit better as to, uh, you know, what works in, in which geography. Uh, but I think the most exciting part is that uh, the common aspect of uh, travel, working with like-minded people, um, and, and this field of revenue management distribution commercial has been uh, super exciting. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I um, you know, as I think about your career path and, and, and uh, you know, as you and I have gotten to know each other a little bit, and then I went back and looked and see where all you've worked, uh, you've definitely crossed paths with some, uh, some interesting, uh, some interesting people in the industry, clearly, um, you know, we'll talk about Taj in a second, because I, uh, I you know, I think that's, uh, uh, you know, kind of an interesting conversation as well. But when you were in Europe, uh, you had the Louvre portfolio, right? And that was the Starwood Capital investment. You mentioned Starwood Capital. Um, but many people don't know, or some people do know, but uh, some people maybe don't know that Barry Sternlicht, uh is, is the sort of the vision behind Starwood Capital and the things that, that uh, SCG does. Um, and so I'm wondering, can, what was that like? You know, you clearly you were working in a big enough asset that you would have had some direct contact with him. Right. Uh, and he's kind of an icon. I mean, he's uh, he's a very special person in his style and everything. What, tell, tell, what was that like? Maybe yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know if there's an anecdote or <laughs> if you could share, uh, if you, there's a story that's shareable, uh, you know, maybe share, share a story or two about uh, about your time in Europe. Yeah, I think I think the whole experience of working in private equity was uh, was quite exciting because before that, most of my experience was with large and medium-sized hotel companies, with Expedia, et cetera. So um, I think private equity is super exciting. It's uh, very focused. It's a little bit intense, fast-paced, uh, because uh, the way Starwood Capital and a lot of these private equity funds work is 
they buy and sell portfolios at different points in time and uh, the vertical in which i was the main idea was to you know buy portfolios uh, run them uh, over 5 7 10 years maximize the value and then eventually spin them off uh, so that whole concept of uh, maximizing value um, and giving it back to the stakeholders in a private equity type environment definitely gives you um, a very different insight on the business uh, also from an asset management perspective uh, working with Barry obviously was was amazing. Uh, luckily or unluckily, I didn't see him very often. Uh, so, so he was headquartered out of Connecticut. I mean, I was there only for a brief time, and then I was uh, shipped to Paris, and and that was obviously an easy decision. Um, but but at least the meetings that we had with him, at least on a quarterly or a six monthly basis, you could see the brilliance of uh, Barry in the discussions, how he was sharp in the numbers, and how he was always, you know, a couple of slides ahead of uh, what what we were discussing. So lots to learn there, and obviously he bring, he brought significant experience of running Starwood hotels worldwide, uh, you know, things like Heavenly Beds, uh, the Starwood Loyalty Program and things like that so he's uh, he's an incredible um, uh, person and and someone to learn from uh, it was a great experience cool yeah i mean when i think of him a little bit um you know right now a lot of us have fallen in love with the term disruption um and i think of him as being disruptive kind of before it was cool you know <laughs> like very was disruptive before disruptive was cool yeah I mean, that's going all the way back to the heavenly bed and some of those kind of things you know you're, it's very true um he also has a really uncanny knack of surrounding himself with really good people i mean i think that you and i both know some people uh you know cody bradshaw who happens to be responsible for for europe here is just a super solid guy right and right. and uh and then a mutual friend that we have ash kapoor is really one of the you know he's one of my favorite people in the business yeah um, so i think that says a lot about a leader also right that they can they can uh, bring in strong people um you know he has a very strong personality but if it's about your ego, you don't surround yourself with those kind of people, right? And he's, he's, uh, no, I think it probably was a very, very interesting experience. And, uh, and you, you got involved in a very interesting transaction, right? Because those hotels were anything from about 10 rooms to some big hotels and everything in between. It was a very interesting portfolio that you got. Yeah, yeah. It was a very good experience. I mean, we had a thousand plus properties in 40 plus countries and a really good mix of own managed and franchised uh, properties. And, you know, working in Europe, in France, uh, labor laws, what you can do, what you can't do, um, how do you interact with the franchise community, the, the legalities around it, uh, definitely a, a great experience and, and a good turnaround story as well, because I think we were able to uh, sell the portfolio at the right multiple, which was uh, which was good. Yeah, from what I understand, it was a successful thing too, right? Which is kind of nice to be able to, you know, you did all that work and then you look back in and go, it actually worked. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's that's an interesting one. Now let's. I want to. We're gonna just. Uh, uh, this is. Uh, I, I feel like I'm worshiping you for a little while, but I, I, your career is fun to talk about. Um, you mentioned Taj, but you mentioned it in a very humble way, um, and you didn't mention that you were CRO at Taj. And and one of the things that's kind of interesting is I think back, you're one of the first people that had the CRO title. I mean, there were VPs of revenue and all kind of, and, and senior VPs of sales and marketing and those kind of things but you're one of the first ones. Um, and so, you know, you have this great hospitality pedigree and now you're not in the business anymore or you're at least not working in a, in a hotel. Um, how did that happen? I mean, how did you contemplate that decision? Um, you know, you mentioned it in good terms, so I'm not afraid to ask, but uh, tell me about that. You know, how was that part? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, a little bit about Taj and that role of the chief revenue officer. Um, so I had background with Taj because like I mentioned, this was my first hotel job and, and my background was in revenue management. And then coming back after all these years to an iconic brand like Taj was uh, was really fun. So when I got done in Paris with, uh, with the Louvre portfolio, uh, Taj had you know new uh, management team on board and uh, Mr. Rakesh Sarna, who used to be the president of Hyatt Americas uh, before his role with uh, Taj joined as the CEO of Taj. And I knew him, you know, just from industry connections, and and we we were just uh, connecting uh, in general. And he said that he's looking at creating a new role to basically bring all the commercial functions together. And that I found, um, you know, really exciting because I think in the uh, in a lot of CEO world, uh, I think the concept of chief commercial officer now is becoming a little bit more popular. But it's really powerful. And the more I discussed that opportunity with him, I, I knew that this would be something that will be super exciting. So uh, so the role was created for the first time and then uh, sales, marketing, digital uh, revenue management, distribution, uh, PR, branding, loyalty, all these functions basically rolled into this uh, larger role. And the biggest advantage was that it forced these departments to just work together. 
Um, and there are many examples on what the business needs, what is marketing supposed to push, how can revenue management and distribution influence that, uh, which target markets and segments is the sales team chasing and what they should do and what they should not do. Uh, the voice of the customer, which basically, you know, you use that from social media, et cetera, to understand uh, how do you communicate back to the larger audience? What is the brand recall, brand equity? So I think it's a, it was a great experience. And for a brand like Taj, which has been around for 100 years, and uh, they're obviously part of the larger Tara group, uh, which is an iconic group on its own with, with a huge market cap with other brands like Jaguar, Land Rover, et cetera. So, uh, so definitely, you know, a great, uh, great experience uh, there and, and a lot of good learnings. And you're right. I think a lot of mainstream companies now have incorporated the roles of chief commercial officer with great success because they're able to, uh, you know, bring all these disciplines together, which, uh, which, uh, which uh, works a lot. Um, and then after that great experience, uh, 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 moving to rate gain was, you know, completely like 180 degree kind of a turn. Uh, so very different uh, getting into travel technology. When you're in the hotel world, you get a little bit complacent because you're the center of the universe. Everybody comes to you and, and you know, you maximize what you have. Uh, whereas in the travel technology world, it's a little bit more fast paced. Uh, so the first three months, I mean, to be honest, I was, I was, uh, my head was just spinning. Uh, I was surrounded by product and tech people. And, um, uh, you know, I was still kind of figuring out uh, what the swim lanes were and what am I supposed to do. Uh, but the experience has been pretty exciting. So, um, so, so, you know, which kind of leads me into talking about rate gain um, a little bit. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, do me a favor. Uh, it would be amazing. Uh, as you know, um, you know, a, a lot of uh, European markets, uh, you're, we're still introducing tools and products like this. You know, it's not quite the same as, as uh, the U.S., which is so branded. Therefore, everyone is really much more accustomed to this kind of technologies and, and support stuff and everything. But, yeah, just tell I was going to ask you, just what does Rate Gain do? And uh, perfect timing on the slide, Enzo. Well done. Uh, so let's uh, yeah, tell us about it. Yeah, so so rate gain is a very interesting business. Um, uh, we are probably a well-kept uh, secret, but pretty much everybody on the webinar have touched us in one way or the other. Uh, so rate gain is about a 15-year-old company focused purely on travel technology with three distinct verticals, and I'll talk about them a little bit uh, more. But in in but fundamentally, we are a B2B software as a service company, and we operate in. Uh, three sub verticals revenue management pricing intelligence distribution connectivity and then social media guest engagement uh, so these are kind of our uh, you know three broad areas that we work in um, we had modest beginnings you mentioned travel click uh, a lot of people don't know that we powered the rate shopping uh, business for travel click as a white label for many years before we branched off um, and then some of our early customers included booking.com and expedia on the rate shopping side where we were supporting all these otas and a lot of uh, car rental and airline companies to just ensure that yeah, their pricing was competitive and give them pricing intelligence on the markets. Uh, so if you look at this slide, this just talks about how we uh, look at the customer journey and how we are providing an end-to-end -end platform to basically unlock a uh, new revenue for uh, everybody that we work with. So uh, if you look at the typical customer journey, uh, you know, they expect uh, the travel providers to know them, anticipate the needs, uh, find where they're shopping to convert, uh, great on-site experience. It could be airlines, cruises, car rentals, or hotels, uh, listening to their needs, customizing the products and services so that they're served better. Uh, and then the whole cycle basically continues through social media, uh, et cetera. So like I said, uh, rate gain has three distinct verticals. The oldest one is uh, cognitive revenue management, pricing intelligence. So business started with uh, rate shopping and pricing intelligence. Uh, and then the smart distribution part grew over a period of time. So rate gain has two enterprise models of uh, distribution connectivity. We work with pretty much all the major hotel chains and thousands of independent hotels in EMEA and APAC. Uh, and the main difference, the main reason we exist is uh, we are in the plumbing business, so we connect what we call supply and demand partners uh, in a very efficient way. Uh, and then uh, the last piece is uh, through an acquisition that we did about six months ago in the U.S. Uh, for a social media niche uh, digital agency called BCB Social. And that piece is very interesting because uh, we work on behalf of hotels and we manage social media handles. And we also create social media content and listening tools. Um, and, and we're in the process of um, cross-pollinating a lot of these products and services so that we can uh, offer them as enterprise uh, solutions. 
Um, and, and, and this slide basically just talks about all some of the key clients that we have. Like I said, we're very lucky that we've been in the business long enough and, and we work with all the major players across these verticals. Um, and the folks on the webinar, I think they must have touched uh, our technology in one way or the other. For the folks in America, if you're booking any hotel rooms on Hotwire, Hotel Tonight, a lot of OTA channels, uh, wholesale partners like Destination of the World, et cetera, there's a good chance that we are powering the content and the connectivity behind it. Uh, if you're uh, booking a GDS travel agency rate through a tool like Agencia, or if you're booking any higher hotel as an example on the GDS, uh, those reservations are being powered through us. So these are just some examples, uh, but we are in the in, in, in backstage, so to say, uh, but we do power a lot of these uh, uh, clients and, and we're very happy to be in that position. So, so for people that are a little bit uninitiated, who does that mean your customer is? Is your customer the hotel? Is your customer uh, the hot wire and hotel tonight, for example, in that, in that example? Who's your customer? Yeah, <laughs> Who pays yeah. you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it varies by vertical, but most uh, in most of the cases, uh, uh, so like in distribution as well as in the social media content creation business, it's the supply. So it's the hospitality verticals or whoever we manage content or connectivity for. Uh, but then pretty much everybody is a client of ours. So we don't have any travelers as customers. Like I said, we are B2B. Uh, but we work with hotel supply, air supply, car supply, and also with demand channels. So anywhere where customers shop and anywhere where customers uh, stay or book or experience services, uh, we are in the middle. Uh, so that's kind of the uh, model. And then the good thing is that uh, we have access to so much of data because of what we do. We've started to cross-pollinate a lot of our products and services to make them better. So as an example, we have something which we call market drone. Uh, which is, I think, quite innovative. And I think, Scott, you'll like it, given your background. Um, so we're using our distribution intelligence to actually power uh, pricing. And what that means is that uh, we see billions of transactions across the world on both shops and books. And that gives us a good indicator of uh, demand. And uh, instead of just shopping anywhere, we can go surgically by market uh, to give our clients the feedback on what booking windows are moving, what's happening when, because we can use those hints uh, across thousands of hotels and actually power pricing intelligence. So that's just one example. But the overall thought process we have is that uh, let's just use all data. Uh, we think of it as a data lake and uh, let's see what more can we do uh, by providing uh, uh, value. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, you, my face starts to change a little bit. That's when my friends think I'm weird. Um, but I think the data that you guys would have available, um, and I don't mean the customer individual data, that stuff scares me now. I don't <laughs> I don't want to have to uh, give 25% of my annual revenues to uh, some European country. Um, but, um, but I think the customer data in aggregate is fascinating, right? And you would literally have the ability to see, um, you know, as people move from device to device. And I know for me personally, I have a real digital tendency to shop and dream on one advice, but buy on one device, but buy on another one, for example. And I think that the, the ability to really delve into that information in the thousands and hundreds of thousands of transactions and really understand that is um, is is cool insight that you're able to provide when it comes all the way down to your sales force talking to people about how they can help a hotel be more successful in a specific thing right so it's so you know that giant reach that you have from the ability to collect uh, from the ability to collect information um you know kind of puts you in that google category of uh you've got all this really great information and so we're all paying really close attention to see how you decide to use it um yeah, right. you know, and that's, that's really a good point so i think uh, since we have access to so much of data, we also are able to use that data to you know, help our clients uh, make better decisions. So as an example, in the revenue management world, if you remember from our days, uh, the, the focus on who do you compete against, that typical competitive set was very myopic. It was two mile radius and the typical <laughs> yeah, brand. Absolutely. And we have tools which actually tells you that who do you really compete against by category, if you're transient or group, et cetera. You know the impact of alternate lodging and market selling market pass because we can see demand being funneled away uh, and we are able to track how much supply and demand is uh, you know available in every market on a forward-looking basis uh, so i think the tools are getting interesting and coming back to your, one of the questions on what makes a good revenue manager or what qualities are required um, i think data crunching machine learning uh, ability to use ai point them in the right direction uh, what really are the triggers for demand? I think these things have become almost uh, very important because luckily 
there are a lot of tools available which do the mechanics of revenue management so in terms of yield management you know any kind of automated revenue management software will be able to give you a good output uh, but then i think the real value of the executives now is who can you know make sense of all this data and noise around them and use them effectively and the ones who do will are the ones who will actually gain market share in the local marketplace I, I i i couldn't agree more i think um you know with this wonderful technology that we've got available right and and even um in in uh, in the degree that i'm responsible for here at la roche one of the courses we teach is ai and machine learning and we actually uh teach students with big chunks of data with a, a program called rapid miner which is for people who don't know it's kind of most people know tableau and so when you compare tableau to excel i would kind of compare rapid miner to tableau in that it's you don't have to be a programmer but you can drag and drop and understand some some machine learning components and i personally think that's going to be one of the most amazing things that we send our students off with because they'll have the ability i'm not looking for them to be data scientists but i am looking for them to understand which project they should give to a data scientist and which project doesn't matter very much. And so I think there's a, a leadership level of knowledge that people are going to have to have in all these different technical areas that, you know, you're not going to be a web designer, but you need to know enough about that to be able to be an educated consumer when someone's going to do work on your website. So there's, there's all these different uh, levels of knowledge that uh, I think that, uh, um, you know, they all, as I mentioned before, they'll kind of converge in, in, in the space that uh, that we're in. Yeah. Um, and that's actually really good to hear that you're including that, uh, you know, in the academic uh, programs, because I think that just enables our young executives as they enter the workforce um, to pretty much hit the ground running. Uh, because back in the day, I remember uh, two decades ago, the curriculum used to be a lot more academic. And it's really interesting to see because we, we spoke just before the show on what the focus is in your uh, program, et cetera. So that's that's really encouraging that you're focusing on, you know, things like machine learning, AI, coding, um, you know, using data analytics uh, and digital transformation. I think that's uh, that's very encouraging to hear. Yeah, I mean, it's it's if you think about it, it um, you know, the, in the circle that I ran in. So for several years, I had an opportunity to listen to people who are asking me, hey, who do you have that's really technically oriented? Um, because one of the things I found was the people that weren't great communicators, sometimes they were more technically oriented. And they, they were better suited in that environment. Um, but there wasn't a real path for people to get there if that's what they wanted to do. Um, and so I think you're right. I think I'm really excited about because they can at least someone who's interested in that can kind of you know, effectively self-select and put together a CV that uh, demonstrates to employers like you guys that this is the part of the business I'm interested in. And I've gotten some foundational work, at least to know that I like it and that my brain is wired that way to be able to understand it. Even if we just do that much, I think we're, 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 uh, uh, we're giving people a, a head start. So thanks for bringing that up. That was a free yeah. commercial. That was awesome. <laughs> um, so, I mean, do me a favor, give me just a couple examples of like big wins from a hotel perspective, you know, like, you know, your three most happy customers, what would they tell me if they were on the on the uh, on the podcast right now? Yeah. So, I mean, in the current business, uh, we, are, we are basically uh, our business is to remove all friction in, you know, revenue maximization and distribution and connectivity. Um, so I think the happy customers would would say things like we're easy to work with. We are flexible. Uh, one of the things that we do at, at scale is since we work with so many partners, we're able to be, bring best practices to the table as well. And a lot of times we're able to tell customers on untapped demand or uh, you know lost opportunities in the marketplace because a lot of times uh, if we have a customer in the U.S. they might not know which OTAs internationally are bringing how much demand into the local market. Uh, so we have a platform called Smart Distribution which does this at scale where uh, you're able to actually see that uh, localized OTAs in let's say Indonesia or India or China. Uh, how what kind of demand is coming into the local market, which might be going to uh, you know competition which they don't even know about. So we're able to anonymize a lot of data to actually tell them what are the pricing trends, uh, what is the size of the pipe that's uh, coming from feeder markets outside the U.S. Uh, and that's very uh, you know illuminating. So the top customers will tell us that you know we use the data effectively, we are easy to work with, uh, we bring new ideas on the table, and we share best practices. Uh, and I think that uh, works really well because we learn from the customers and vice versa, uh, and and we just love uh, travel. Uh, I am super. By the way, I want to thank the audience. Thank you for not making this a coronavirus session. Um, <laughs> 
uh, you know, I think there's a lot of information out there. I think you, you can you can find it and, and start after a while it starts to just be repetitive and panic causing. Um, but one of the things I think that is is relevant to that is, is as the world learns how to survive with stuff like this. I don't think this is the last time that we're going to see a, a global kind of an issue. Um, and so you mentioned, you know, think about as we get better at cordoning off where there's a problem and the rest of us continue about our lives normally. There's really a big role for understanding your feeder markets and saying, ooh, it's really sort of socially irresponsible for us to still be advertising in Milan for as a feeder city. We should point our, uh, our, our, our marketing dollars over here somewhere else where there's no issue at all in, in terms of global problems. So it does seem relevant, at least in that regard, uh, you know, that we can kind of you know, sort of refine that so we can start to, to at least continue to exist a little bit. I mean, I think what's happening for all of us, uh, I'm a little bit you know, quite frankly, feel very fortunate that I'm in education now because, you know, you and I both, I think most of our social groups are in the industry and a lot of our friends are, are really in, in, in a lot of distress in terms of uh, the difficult decisions they're having to make about staffing levels and those kind of things. So yeah, uh, I think yeah. we learn how to do a better job the next time this comes up and we start to point ourselves and really understand that, okay, I've got to let that feeder market go because we really don't want anybody traveling from there right now. So I can focus my dollars over here. Not quite as high of a willingness to pay, but not restricted from a travel perspective. So let's advertise to them instead. Um, so that level of intelligence, I think, has a huge role in, in our industry, continuing to be a healthy industry in the future. You know, it's, right. It's, it's really yeah. Cool. Yeah. No, that I completely agree with that. I think we're going through some unprecedented times. I'm sure this will get over like we've, you know, weathered the previous storms. Uh, but in a way, I relate to a lot of students who are in school right now, because I remember my days, um, I was already working for a few years before I went for my MBA program. And, and I started in, in, in Europe and started the course late August in 2001 and 9-11 and happened just a few weeks later uh, and pretty much everything kind of came to a standstill. But at the same time, I think we can use this time to you know, really sharpen our skills, understand what's going on. Um, I mean, these kind of events are unprecedented, but you know, they also make you future proof. Um, so the more you can learn about what's going on in the industry, how people are reacting, what the trends are, uh, you know, you can, you will, you will carry this uh, lore with you that, uh, you know, you survived and you uh, came out better. Um, and then I think your point about digital marketing and social media, et cetera, is, is very accurate. I think the good thing is everything can be so quantified and tracked that you know exactly what's, uh, what's going on and, uh, and companies can react in a fast way. And uh, they also have to use common sense and be sensitive about what to promote and what not to promote based on what's going on. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's, so that's equally important as well. But uh, but yeah, I mean, digital marketing is amazing. Uh, the amount of customization that you can do is is uh, is tremendous. Yeah, I think it's the ultimate measurement of, uh, of of willingness to pay and price elasticity for people to, you know, willing to crawl across a border, uh, you know, to sneak sneak from one country to another in order to take advantage of a hotel deal. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's I mean, you mentioned employment. I think that's a perfect segue for us. Um, and so uh, in a second, we're going to bring we, one of the things we do in the digital transformation happy hours. We give a student uh, every week an opportunity to uh, who's interested in a career in this part of the, the business, an opportunity to uh, do an elevator pitch. And we give them some feedback. But before we do that, I was just kind of wondering if you wouldn't mind, like, tell me some of the rate that, you know, what are the positions at rate gain that are, you know, the masses, right, that, that you're constantly looking for people and that they're kind of the entry uh, into your organization, and then what's a potential career path for someone that's uh, successful? What does it look like? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, we do have a structured internship program. The advantage we have is that uh, we're not a huge company, uh, so we're able to give a lot of focus and attention to anybody who's, uh, you know, within the umbrella. So we do have 10 offices worldwide. The significant presence is in Dallas and Chicago and Barcelona, London, and then New Delhi. Um, uh, but we are mostly a technology player. So uh, we are surrounded by product and tech people. Luckily, most of them are smarter than me, which is really good. Uh, so from an entry-level position perspective, uh, we get a lot of uh, young engineers who have backgrounds in uh, you know, computer science and, and tech. Um, the postgraduate students that we get typically might have some background in uh, business intelligence and data uh, analytics, artificial intelligence. Um, and then uh, sales, marketing, and commercial is, is pretty much open. Anybody who has interest in, in travel, uh, who's, who's good at communicating, who's uh, uh, willing to interact with 
both our supply and demand partners to grow our business and and the sales role and the account management roles also are a little bit more technical uh, because the products are more technical so an understanding of uh, the business obviously helps uh, but the frontline roles would be existing more in sales marketing and commercial on product and tech they get a little bit more technical from an education standpoint um, and and we're not a huge company we're about 700 people right now but we're growing well and uh, outside what's going on right now, I mean, we have we have very good plans of uh, growing further. Cool. So uh, I'll tell you what, Enzo, let's take one second and address that question because it's kind of an interesting question. And then we'll uh, uh, we'll have our uh, our guest Virginia on. But um, so there was a question. Uh, I'm not sure if you can also see that, Chinmay, but uh, it was by uh, Geet Narang. And he says, uh, currently, demand is down for all domains and travel. But when things look stable in the future, what factors should an aspiring revenue manager consider to grab the max market share? Um, and so I, I wanna, I'm just going to mention one thing, and then I would definitely want to hit you up for it, too. Uh, the thing I think that people need to make sure that they're aware of is lead time is going to be different when right. it comes back. People are going to make decisions very differently. So if you compare it to your old demand curve and freak out, you're probably freaking out for no reason. Uh, if you compare it to your old demand curve and it matches, then you probably have a problem too. Um, so I think you have to understand that it's it's um, going to be an unprecedented time that there's no historical precedent for, which means all of your automation is going to be somewhat hindered because it's not going to have good history to work with. Right. Um, I, I think you're going to have to understand that. So I think you need to stay in touch with people that know what's happening with current demand. So that means staying really close to your OTA market managers. That means staying really close to the people that help you with uh, social media. If you've got someone that helps you with that, because some markets are going to start to travel sooner than others, I think culturally, right. uh, some are more adventurous. I mean, it's, you know, I remember going to Cuba one time when you still weren't supposed to go to Cuba from the United States thinking I was this incredible pioneer and it was full of German people. <laughs> So I was like, okay, I'm not, I'm not quite as worldly as I thought. Um, but I think that that's the other thing is understanding feeder markets. I think a lot of data intelligence, it, it, current data intelligence, and if it doesn't match the history, I think that's to be expected would be the one thing that I would say. How about yeah. you, Chinmay? Yeah, no, I think everything you said, I mean, by the way, that was like a 10 out of 10 answer. Uh, you, I think, covered a lot of the fair points. Uh, I think one thing to keep in mind is that uh, this will definitely get over. And during this time, I think uh, just stay focused on uh, there's only so much of demand that will come with low prices, right? So no no point unnecessarily diluting the revenue. Uh, there is a price elasticity curve that you should be aware of. And beyond a point, you'll start to hurt the product and the brand, et cetera. So be very careful on um, not going down that rate spiral. I think that's, that's super important. The good thing is that at least the people who have been in the business for some time, they kind of understand and they've learned from the previous episodes uh, like these, which is really good. Uh, but then as as things start to come back, you're, you're spot on. I think speak to your OTA market managers, uh, utilize data to see which feeder markets are working well, uh, stay in touch with current affairs. So even right now, for example, we can see where bookings and cancellations, what the trends are and by geography. And, and we can always already see that China, especially Hong Kong, Shanghai, uh, Singapore, et cetera, things have started to stabilize a little bit. It's all relative. But the good thing is that the downward trend has stopped and at least some bookings have started to pick up. Uh, it's also a function of uh, all the travel providers flexing their cancellation policies, so which is giving some consumer confidence. And we saw an immediate tick as soon as airlines took away their restrictions, as soon as hotels said that, hey, you can book now and, and cancel later, even if it's a non-refundable rate. Uh, so I think those are good signs, but also you should understand, like Scott mentioned, that none of your previous trends will, uh, will hold true. The cancellation rates will be very different. The booking windows will be very different. Um, and then from the learnings that we have in the past, it takes at least three months plus to things to become uh, normalized and the amount of impact that uh, the current environment has had on operations it will also take them time to uh, you know come back up and plus consumer confidence will definitely take more time so the trends will be very different the more data and intelligence you have uh, to just manage that i think it's good and it's good to be a little bit conservative in your pricing decisions uh, just so that you know you're not spoiling the brand or the product from a long term perspective uh, yeah, you make a good point about the pricing thing. Um, it's interesting to be sitting in a seat where I'm not worried about going to jail when I talk about pricing. Uh, you know, it's you know, it's 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 really difficult for the industry because uh, I think people are there's a lot of wisdom sitting out there, but it can't be vocal in a public way about what to do and what not to do uh, because of consumer protection laws, which I think are fair. It's, I'm not saying that's wrong, but it's it's a it's a hindrance we have. But I think that we it it is incumbent upon those of us that are not in that position to a little bit to be thought leaders and point out that. The little bit of market share you grab until everyone else lowers their rates to match your rates is not going to come anywhere near 
the amount of money that it's going to take for that market to slowly climb itself back up to the price point that you had before. Because right now, consumers told you a month ago what your hotel was worth because they paid it, right? They wouldn't have paid it if it wasn't worth that. And it's not really worth anything less today simply because there's no demand. And you're not really playing in a demand pool that you can move around. So, uh, but they they will remember that you lowered it. So, and they yeah. and, and the market will remember that you lowered it. And so, if you go back to the different things where you can go back and look at data, like that slow climb back of those rates, you can see markets that got really ugly with each other, and markets that didn't get so ugly, and the ones that didn't get so ugly recovered so much more quickly that I don't really don't care how much market share you got for two weeks right. until everyone figured out that you dropped your rates. It doesn't offset the the, the yeah. slow climb back that took place after the recovery. So, um, so I think it's a. I think you brought that up, and that's super wise. And and that's you know I, I haven't taken an ad out in the New York Times, but it's something that I've been pretty open about speaking about because I think it's a message that needs to get out there to hoteliers that, you know, I, I know we play price elasticity, but at a certain point, the elasticity is not going to make someone travel. People are not going to crawl across a border to take advantage of your wonderful pricing. You're not going to stimulate demand. So, so you're yeah. just kind of ruining the pool for everyone basically so it's, yeah it's and cool. when we when we track data across uh, different geographies we've always seen that occupancy trends will always lead before pricing changes uh, so in a growing market occupancy will always come back first and rate will grow uh, and the same thing happens in decline uh, so smith travel does a really good job of tracking a lot of these uh, jan freetag who's based here in the us is, is a good friend and industry contact and uh, he shared some data with us and we we spoke as well um, so the ADR is to return to the normal uh, price points after any crisis like this, it takes uh, a long time. Uh, so to your point, I think you have to be super careful of how low you drop those rates uh, because then it just uh, takes forever. Um, and then the costs on the operation side have always been going up. So for the industry to stay profitable, I think it's also important to make sure that uh, we are priced appropriately. For sure. All right, cool. So let's shift gears. Uh, Enzo, do me a favor. Let's talk about the future now. <laughs> and the person who is fortunate enough to be graduating in a couple of months to all of this. Uh, but let's let's bring Virginia on. I'll quickly introduce Virginia Stamboli. Uh, Virginia is a, a Virginia is an MBA two MBA two student in her second semester, uh, getting her uh, MBA in global hospitality here at uh, La Roche, or actually not here at La Roche. In fact, she's sitting in uh, someplace else, which we'll talk about after. Um, but with no further ado, let's have her tell her a little bit about have her tell us a little bit about herself. Sorry about that, and then we'll uh, we'll go from there. So, Virginia, it's all yours. Thank you, Scott. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to take part to the Digital Transformation Happy Hour today. Uh, as you said, my name is Virginia, and I am currently an MBA student at La Roche. As you may have understood from my super horrible accent, uh, I was born and raised in Italy, uh, where I was always surrounded by beauty. Uh, with beauty, I mean not only nature, but also cities, architecture, works of arts, ideas, everything. The sad thing uh, is that not only in Italy, but everywhere, this beauty is very bad managed, according to me. And my mission has always been to do something about that. So uh, I obtained both my bachelor and master degree in Milan, uh, integrating managerial and cultural subjects, because I think that the integration of business and culture uh, really could give birth to something great. Uh, after the degrees, uh, I worked mainly in events um, when I learned the importance of customer experience. But soon enough, I realized that tourism events, entertainment, and this kind of industry uh, can really play a role. And I wanted to understand how their impacts can benefit not only the territory, but also people, individuals, and their experiences. Um, so I wanted to know more. Uh, and this is why I joined uh, uh, the Master in Business uh, Administration at Le Roche uh, in Switzerland. Uh, where I am now integrating technical um, knowledge like revenue management uh, and subjects uh, about real cases. I am sure, or actually I do hope now, uh, that when this uh, hospitality situation will get better, I will have the chance to do my part uh, and contribute to this kind of beauty management uh, all over the world. So thank you for this opportunity. Cool. First of all, nice job. Um, I love that you have that focus 
um, and you're that clear in in uh, uh, in what your goals are. I think that's very it's very interesting. Um, and uh, I've got some other stuff that I've got some funny things I want to talk with you about and some more questions I want to ask you, but that's yeah. going to give my an opportunity to give you some feedback and drop my pen. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, okay. So Chinmay, uh, feedback. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I think, uh, first of all, Virginia, I have canceled and rebooked my trip for uh, Italy uh, in six months. Uh, so. Great. At least we rebooked. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I think the key part is rebooked. So yes, so definitely looking forward to visiting your beautiful country. It's it's one of my favorites. Uh, I had the opportunity to live in France for about five years and, and one of our favorite uh, places and countries to visit always was, uh, was Italy, uh, both for myself and the family. So very, very fond memories. Um, I think I think what you are going through obviously is unprecedented, and and we're all, you know, hoping and praying that it gets over soon. Um, I think the exposure that you're getting at Le Roche also will will definitely, you know, give you the firepower to get back uh, to the market and and do everything that you want more effectively, be it in Italy or be it anywhere. Uh, so it's really interesting to hear uh, what you've done so far, uh, what you're currently doing, and what your plans are. So uh, thank you for sharing. Thank you. Um, and I think those are those are excellent comments. Yeah, I think it is an unprecedented time, um, but I think it's also um, uh, it's also an interesting time for people because I think there will be a very interesting recovery quite soon. Um, I saw I saw an interesting post from someone today on LinkedIn that said that um, the true visionaries right now are accumulating resumes, <laughs> which I thought was pretty interesting <laughs> post. Um, and so we I hope so on your, on your uh, certainly on your behalf I hope that um, but I think also knowing you a little bit I think that um, that choice is a really cool choice for you I think that more and more hospitality is getting into cultural things whether that's figuring out how to bring economic improvement to areas that don't have improvement because they have natural beauty um, but they don't have economic opportunities there uh, and I think of some uh, companies like Six Senses Resorts for example that has a, a, a very much of a brand positioning around some of that sort of thing um, and I think that's only going to become more and more prevalent I think in not just, you know, there's this holistic and nature oriented piece, but I can see something similarly positioned around art and around culture. And, and, uh, and as you mentioned, the beauty of cities, which, uh, which people don't always see. So I think it's kind of, I think it's kind of a cool idea. I think there's actually even potentially an entrepreneurial idea in there for someone that's passionate um, in terms of that, not necessarily, uh, you know, a, a larger organization, um, but I think it's also really timely. I think that's pretty neat as well. Um, so that was that's what I would share with you about your uh, about your your pitch and your career choice, um, and good luck to you. Um, and then I was also <laughs> going to put you on the spot a little bit for for just the last few minutes we have. Uh, you and I went on uh, the tech tour together. We took a bunch of students um, to uh, Geneva, and then we went to uh, we went to Amsterdam, and we did a bunch of really interesting things uh, with the finalists from an innovation contest. And then you were chosen as one of the other student representatives because uh, at La Roche, one of the things that for us is very important is to make sure that we we get some interaction between different levels because, uh, you know, those guys, you know, someday they aspire to be Chinmai, but in the shorter term, they aspire to be you. Um, and so, and you were a perfect representative. It was actually really fun to get to know you a little bit and what you did um, on that trip. But I was wondering if you'd kind of share, uh, you know, some of the highlights. What was the interesting part about that, uh, about that weekend for you? Yeah, of course. So uh, basically, the marketing team, uh, as well as the LaRoche management, organized this team as a prize for a competition about innovation. Um, so I actually did not even take part to the, to the competition, but I was invited. So I had the real pleasure to stay and understand um, the idea that all these guys that are really, really young and they just uh, decided to enter the hospitality industry had. And they were really broad, like from cruise uh, to food to uh, cricket and sports. So I, I love how hospitality is that big. And they had all these amazing ideas that they also tried to connect to all the um, actors that we met in Lausanne, Geneva, and Amsterdam. Um, actually, we um, saw that digital transformation is not just about hotels, but about everything in hospitality. So also uh, something that is related to my passion that is art. Uh, so something about uh, tickets to museum and to attractions, but also to uh, kind of experience. Indeed, we visited a super cool Insta sort of Instagram museum. And everything was uh, digital, not in the sense of internet based, but in sense of everything. It was like digital marketing integration, um, it was personalization with uh, the customers. It was 
um, how to involve everybody in the body and the mind of the clients or customer or whatever in your activity. Uh, it was also about augmented reality, about technology in its pure sense, like iPads to control uh, everything in your hotel room, etc. So yeah, what I think I learned is that digital transformation is coming, is already here. And if you really want to have a competitive edge, um, for example, in hospitality, you can do like great things um, by doing that. Also, try not to fight with the biggest ones like Four Season or Rosewood or the, the really luxury one that, of course, have another um, kind of competition among themselves and do something more niche, but more digitally up to date that can maybe have uh, an audience in the new market of millennials, Generation Z or whatever. Yeah, um, one of the things that we saw, which I thought was very interesting, I think you referred to, uh, there's a two-room hotel in Amsterdam, and all it is is product test. Uh, you can book it. It's online. They, they only sell themselves on the OTAs. They have one suite and one regular room, and when you check in, the clock radio will most likely be different than the clock radio that was there for the person before. Uh, so it was, really, it was really cool, and, and I think that's a horrible example because that's not, um, but it, it was, you know, a lot of voice-activated stuff in the room, a lot of really, really cool technology that, um, that people are kind of using these this two-room hotel with a, a, an innovation person to iron the kinks out. So that was pretty cool. Um, the other thing I was just going to mention to you real quick, and then Chin, I have some. We I, normally I do something in the middle of the show, but we got talking so much, I I didn't break in and do that. Um, uh, that's kind of fun, and then we'll wrap up with that. But uh, so tell us, uh, uh, Virginia, you went home, and home is Milan to you. So I think for most people in the rest of the world, uh, that's like wow. <laughs> um, but what's it like? What's going on? Well, uh, luckily I had my car, so I didn't have to get on a plane or a train from Switzerland. I came back home two days ago uh, when uh, the canton where Le Roche is uh, suggested to, to, leave the, to leave the school, uh, to, be more to be more isolated and safe. Uh, actually, Milan is empty. There is no one around, and this is good because uh, there are some rules about uh, self-isolation also, of course, if you don't have any symptoms. Uh, unlikely cases are really a lot and also death, so it's not that uh, a happy atmosphere. But I have to say that people are trying to keep hope and already following the rule is something very good that can help you prevent the illness. And also, I don't know if you saw these videos yeah. on Instagram or YouTube about people who play their instruments on the balcony. So at six, uh, every night, there is something. Uh, maybe, maybe an applause for the hospital that is nearby or like the church bells that sounds for just to, to remind everybody that, okay, you're at home, you don't see anybody else, but we are all in this together and everything will go smoothly. So let's just hope for the best. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that's cool. All right. Amazing well, that was very, very interesting, right? I thought, you went home to where? Okay. I mean, I think that's really cool. I think it does speak a little bit to um, to community and some of those kind of things and how we're going to have to learn how to live a little differently. Okay. So Chinmai, normally at some point or another, uh, you know, we kind of just got involved in a conversation. All of a sudden it was 45 minutes later. Uh, but normally at some point during that conversation, I break in and kind of ask some fun questions during the show. So I'm going to do that at the end and we'll finish with that. But uh sure. They're always fun. So here we go. Ready? Uh, so here's uh, this is one I think might be my favorite one. And I'm going to lead with it. When you're dealing with something questionable in your refrigerator, do you read the date or do you trust your nose? <laughs> I read the date. <laughs> you read the date, okay? All right. So that's you're my wife in our house. That's uh, I can tell when I've been away because the garbage is always full of stuff that I think shouldn't be quite thrown away yet. But anyway, that's how we, that's how we roll. I'm I'm a smeller. Um, how low does your gas tank normally get before you start looking to fill it? Oh, probably 20 miles left. Oh, really? Oh, Very one low, of those. Yeah. Okay. Um, better long weekend with friends, clubbing in South Beach or museums in Paris? Oh, wow. That's a tough one. I love both, but I would go with museums in Paris. Okay, cool. Good for you. Uh, and you would know. You've lived there, so that's good. Uh, this one, I like this one. Water, wine, espresso, or wheatgrass smoothie? Wine. Wine. Okay. Describe your ideal day off. Um... Just spending time with family and kids and uh, playing cricket. Oh, cool. All right. Good. <laughs> What's the best gift you've received recently? 
Uh, my uh, Bluetooth uh, Bose headset makes life a lot easier. Oh, nice. Okay. Over the ear, in the ear, which one? It's the one around the neck. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, oh. I, I yeah. like that. It's not really in your ears, right? You hear it yeah. through your skeletal system or some kind of thing. That's yeah. pretty cool. Uh, really cool. Uh, how about the worst gift? Um, some painting which I haven't hung yet. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. <laughs> I had a painting for a while by a family. It was my grandmother um, that I only hung when my mom came over. <laughs> that, so. That's a good move. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it was, you know, I never I did pretty well. I never forgot. And now I actually cherish it, believe it or not. But for a while, it was one of those things. Something else hung there. Uh, favorite hotel in the world, and why? Um, I have to go to uh, Taj Hotels. There is one in a place called Udaipur. It's called the Lake Palace, uh, and it's in the middle of a lake. Uh, mm -hmm. 300 year old property, uh, just beautiful. Yeah, I actually, um, I used to have my, my first semester marketing students choose a business and then blog about it for the whole semester while we learned about positioning and things like that. And that hotel was one that was rel relatively frequently chosen. It's like you check in, you can take a water shuttle to check in and stuff, right? It's really cool. It's exactly. Really cool. It was also in the James Bond uh, Octopussy movie. Oh, that's, yeah, 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 that's right. That's right. I remember that. Uh, dogs or cats? Dogs. Okay, good answer. <laughs> uh, beach or pool? Beach. Beach. Okay, last one. Night owl or early riser? Night owl. Night owl. All right, cool. Well, Chinmai, Virginia, Enzo. I'm not sure where you are. Back there in the background somewhere. Yeah, I'm um, here. I'm, I'm, all right. I'm more people, you know, interacting. Can you hear me? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I don't all know right. if you have any, any questions hanging. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've seen a lot of people on fire on YouTube commenting, chatting, and it was actually great because they are kind of exchanging, you know, uh, some you know tips and tricks about you know, the current situation in the, in the hospitality industry and they try to, you know, exchange suggestion and uh, that's good. That's good. So cool. I saw that. I saw actually somebody was very optimistic about the demand when it comes back. I think that's very true. I think it's pent up. I know that when someone tells me I can go away for the weekend, I'm going to. Sure. So I think that there's probably a lot of people in that in that boat. So I think that that was a pretty astute comment. I like that one. And I like the positive outlook also. I know I think, you know, we have to learn how to weather this stuff. And the more positive we are, the sooner it's over with. You know? So I think it, that's good. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, let's wrap it up then. Uh, again, Virginia, thanks a ton. Good job. Good Thank luck you. with your search. Uh, Chinmai, thanks as always, man. I think it was very enlightening for people. And, uh, and I enjoyed speaking with you. And Enzo, my friend, until next week. We'll see yeah, you soon. we'll see you next week, guys. And uh, thanks again. Uh, Regain is always in my heart. And uh, we'll see you next week, guys. And uh, you remember that the show must go on, guys, on Final TV. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Digitally transform. See you guys next week. Bye. Thanks, Bye. 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 Bye.